السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته حليمة هي your Quran lifestyle coach Today I want to talk about how we can become more confident because who wouldn't like to experience more of that inner strength that you get in your body when you feel more confident you know who wouldn't want to experience more of that joy just being themselves that you feel when you're more confident You know, why wouldn't we want to feel and experience that energy that you get to pursue the things that you love when you have more confidence in yourself? You know, for you, maybe you've experienced in the past um, that sense of regret that you get in life when you feel you don't have quite enough confidence in yourself to say something that you really wanted to to somebody. Or maybe you've experienced in the past some regrets from not having enough confidence to do something that you felt you needed to do or that you wanted to do uh, or pursue something that you that was really important to you you know maybe you've struggled in the past before with emotions that stem from having a lack of confidence such as fear and anxiety or low self-esteem and self-worth for example and you really want to change that you know you don't want to live with any more regrets you don't want to, you want to start feeling differently about yourself and start you know living more freely Essentially, you want to be more confident. Well, today, inshallah, I'm going to be sharing with you five Quranic ideas on how you can practically go about building more self-confidence, inshallah. Now, in order for us to pursue confidence, I think it's really important that we first understand and define what confidence actually is, right? And that way, we're not going to mistake in confidence for what some people might superficially judge it to be, like never getting nervous, for example, because that's not true or believing that it's somehow going to always lead you to have an arrogance, which again isn't true. Okay, so in the world of personal development, com confidence is something that we human beings are said to develop in our psyche, and it's essentially defined as something that we attain when we have the ability to genuinely express who we truly are and pursue the things that we truly desire. So it comes from having this kind of cohesive sense of identity. So there's an alignment between you know, who you are, your beliefs, your values, and your personal dreams, and then you authentically live that, so you're living the best of who you are on a consistent basis. So in order for us to really become authentic, for us to generate this ultimate level of confidence, it's going to naturally require tip number one, which is self-awareness. Now, a lot of people might ask, you know, how can we go about increasing our levels of self-awareness, you know, to discover more about who we really are, our personal beliefs and values, what our dreams are in life. And the reality is that there are a whole bunch of ways you can do that. You know, you can engage in more self-reflection, you could journal, you can find yourself a coach, you can even do some online personality tests and etc. You know, there are tons of ways that you can learn more about yourself that's going to help you to boost your level of self-confidence, inshallah. But I would say that the ultimate way of gaining the highest levels of self-awareness that I'd actually argue surpasses any other type of method is learning about yourself through learning about and coming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, there's this beautiful famous saying that states, مَنْ عَرَفَ رَبَّهُ عَرَفَ نَفْسَهُ You know, the one who got to know his master truly got to know himself. You know, this isn't a cultural idea. It's actually something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he attests to himself in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah Al-Qaha, he says, فَإِنَّهُ يَعْلِمُ السِّرَّ وَأَخْفَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he knows what's secret and what's even more hidden. Now, a secret is something that you're conscious of, but that you keep hidden inside you, right? And in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that not only is he aware of those things, but he's aware of things that are even deeper inside us. Things that impact the way that you and I, we perceive things in the world around us and the way that we behave now, but are so deep in our subconscious mind, in the deepest recesses of our mind and our memory, that even we ourselves are not aware of and that no one else can fully comprehend about us. Not even a psychiatrist, for example, you know, someone who spends their lives helping people to really explore and better understand the deepest access, you know, aspects of themselves. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us that in order to help us to realize something, to realize that when we get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we remember him and build this spiritual closeness to him, then he allows us to become more aware of ourselves in ways that we have never been before and never will be otherwise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will begin to open up for us, you know, our own levels of consciousness and allow, allow us to really discover deeper things about ourselves in order for us to become more 
uh, better human beings, more healthy, more authentic and confident, inshallah. And if this wasn't true, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he wouldn't have stated the opposite to be true elsewhere in the Quran. Because we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Hashr, he says, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنْفُسَهُمْ You know, don't be like the people who forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so Allah made them forget themselves. So one of the incredible benefits of coming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and having the relationship with him is our own self-awareness. And when we attain that self-awareness and we become authentic to it, then we have a tremendous source of confidence for ourselves, inshallah. Okay, so how do we go about it then? How do we learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and come close to him so that we can, it can lead to us having greater levels of self-awareness and confidence? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah Imran, and hold firmly to the rope of Allah together. Now, a rope, it connects two things together, right? It holds them together. And the actual expression, hablullah, the, the rope of Allah, grammatically in Arabic, it's an idafa, which means that these two words are inseparable. So it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually saying that this rope directly connects to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we should hold on to it, because if we do, then we are directly connected to Allah. And what is that rope exactly? Well, in a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, he said it's the Qur'an himself. You know, this notion of the Qur'an being this ultimate connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that's echoed in hadith as well. So we find the beautiful hadith of the Prophet وسلم, in which he said, إِنَّكُمْ لَا تَرْجِعُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ بِشَيْءٍ أَفْضَلَ مِمَّا خَرَجَ مِنْهُ You know, you're not going to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with anything better than that which came from him, meaning the Qur'an. And this was a really vital teaching that the Prophet ﷺ, he made sure that he really deeply ingrained in the hearts and the practice of his companions. And that's why we find the beautiful statement by one of the Sahaba and Khabab ibn al who said, do whatever you wish to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but know that you will never get closer to him with something more beloved to him than his own words. So, you know, ask yourself honestly, how strong is your relationship with the Quran in your life right now? Ask yourself, you know, what small but significant action could you take today to really start building a greater relationship with it? Because I'm telling you, wallahi, when you start reading the Quran and you start coming across ayat, like in Surah Al-Qin, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells you that he molded you in the best of forms. When you study the Quran and you come across verses in like in Surah Al-Hajj, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he teaches you that he actually sees something in you. He sees a potential that qualifies you to struggle in his service and that's why he actually personally selected you for la ilaha illallah when you study ayat in the quran and you come across surahs like uh, surah al-mu'minun where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know what you learn from it is that he created for you in in jannah al-firdaus the highest parts of jannah a house already because he knows what your capabilities are because he has really high expectations of you and provided you with every possible opportunity for you to attain it you will not be able to feel anything less than the greatest levels of confidence because you know these are things that you and i may, might read in a book or might be told from somebody else that may or may not be true these are facts that are being stated by the ultimate source of knowledge and truth from our creator of last panel time now, before we move on to step two, I just want to quickly add something here that is really super important for us to remember in relation to self-awareness. And that is that, you know, we live in a world today where there is this hype. You know, there's a lot of talk about being authentic to who you are and finding your personal calling in life for you to be really happy, isn't it? But we have to realize that a lot of the self-discovery that takes place in order, you know, for us to discover these things about ourselves, it's actually self-determined. So it's really important we acknowledge the simple flaw in that pursuit. Because like we've seen in the first two ayahs I shared with you, our knowledge of ourselves is actually limited. And you know, and what, what, what's more, we need to realize that even what we do know or assume of ourselves to be right, right now in our lives, it's not actually something that's permanent either. Because I'm sure 10 years ago, you probably identified yourself as a different type of person, right? That's how you would describe yourself today. Or at least you may want different things in life now than you did before. And that's normal, that's you know, natural, because we human beings, we grow and develop over time. Nothing stays stagnant in life. But you know, despite this reality about us all evolving in different ways and at our own paces as we kind of embark on all these individual paths in life, there is one aspect of our identity, of who we truly are and what we truly want, whether we realize this or not, that is forever constant. 
And so this is the most authentic aspect of our being. And so it's actually the secret, if you like, to ultimate happiness and confidence. And that is being a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and aspiring to be with him. And the best way of learning more and to remind ourselves of this very liberating and this confidence boosting reality, and once again, is through the Quran. Okay, now this very powerful first Quranic idea that I shared with you, which was self-awareness, is something that we work on long term, right? But there are actually some practical techniques that we can use right now to immediately help us to feel more confident, inshallah. And one of those that we're going to talk about now, the second tip, is our focus. You know, so our brains, we have to understand, are constantly bombarded with hundreds of pieces of information at any time. And in order for us to avoid being completely overloaded and in order to really maintain a healthy function, it has this kind of filtering system. And it filters all the pieces of information and it extracts for us what's most important for us to focus on in the moment. And it's really important that you know that whatever we choose to focus on from the information that we're exposed to, whether that's positive or negative, we actually program our brain to direct all of our energy and our drive to achieving that result. And that's because where focus goes, energy flows. Now you see the power of focus demonstrated for us in the Quran through two different contrasting examples through the focus of Musa salam, and the focus of Fir'aun. So many of you know that Fir'aun, he once had this premonition, right? He had this dream that there would be a man that was interpreted as there would be a man from Bani Israel that was going to overthrow him, right? And so he made a choice after that day to focus on this fear that he had. He consciously dedicated all his lifelong thoughts and actions to try to prevent that prophecy from coming true. And he actually began that mission, as we know in Surah Al-Baqarah, by ordering the death of all of the male ch children that was born to the Bani Israel, Bani Israel, right? But subhanAllah, it was actually his very actions that stemmed from this obsessive focus he had on his fears that actually resulted in that child being delivered to the very doorsteps of his palace. You know, that led Musa salam, to growing up in the household of Fir'aun and eventually destroying him. And because we know that his order to kill all the sons of Bani Israel actually led Musa's mother to placing him in that basket down the river Nile in the first place, right? SubhanAllah. Now, if you look on the other hand at Musa, salam, you know, one of his primary goals and focuses of his prophethood given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to free Bani Israel from the tyranny of Fir'aun. And when we look at his story, we see the powerful effects that his positive focus um, had and the impact that it had on his levels of confidence as well. So when Musa alayhi salam, he fled Egypt with his people and they reached the Red Sea, we know that they became sandwiched, if you like, between a mountain on one side, between the, uh, the Red Sea in front of them and the oncoming army of Fir'aun. And you know, despite how bleak the situation looked and despite all the negative comments and doubts that came from some of Bani Israel in that moment, we're told that Musa alayhi salam, because of his positive focus, what he was doing, he was actually moving consistently through the crowds of Bani Israel with Harun and Yusha bin Nur, focused on finding a solution to free his people. And the impact that Musa salam's positive focus had on his levels of confidence, it can be seen in the profoundly beautiful statement that he said in response to Bani Israel when he said, you know, and with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we see the successful results that his positive focus and that his confidence had in freeing Bani Israel. Okay, so with that said, if you in your own mind, you're fo focusing all the time on your fears and what you're worried about, if internally you're constantly questioning your own self-worth and your self-esteem, how can you expect to feel more confident about yourself? You can't, right? Okay, so how can we then effectively direct our focus then to something that's more empowering and more positive to help us feel more confident? Well, we can manipulate our focus through the use of strategic questions. You know, questions are really powerful, and that's because whatever question we ask our brains, it will always provide you with an answer. And that's actually why we find interestingly, interestingly in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's constantly asking us questions, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always trying to positively guide our focus in a productive way. So instead of asking yourself disempowering questions like, why am I so rubbish at this? Or why can I never do anything right? Or what bad thing might happen if I do X, Y, and Z? 
which is only going to impact your levels of confidence in a negative way because your brains are going to then provide answers to affirm those beliefs. We need to actually start reprogramming ourselves to asking ourselves questions that are more empowering. Things like, what am I focusing on right now that's making me feel or act with a lack of confidence? Or questions like, what can I be focusing on right now that's going to help me feel more extraordinary levels of confidence in myself? And then I personally suggest that you keep a journal, inshallah, just detailing maybe two or three of these kind of empowering questions that you can then ask yourself on a daily basis to kind of positively direct your focus, inshallah, so you can feel more confident. And then just get in that habit of regularly asking yourself those questions. Now, the third Quranic idea I have for you, inshallah, to help you build more confidence is your physiology, the way that you use your body. Okay, so the reality is that a lot of people, they just kind of wait around for certain events or experiences to happen to them in life in order to start feeling confident about themselves. So they think they're going to feel more confident when they achieve a certain qualification, for example, or when they lose X amount of kg, or they get a certain verbal acknowledgement or love from a certain person. When the truth is that you can actually instantly create the feelings of confidence that you want, or any kind of emotion really, by consciously utilizing your physiology. And that's because motion creates emotion. Because when you choose to embody the physiological, the physical traits that define a certain emotion, whether that's positive or negative, you actually instinctively create and amplify those associated feelings. You know, we can see the effect that our physiology has on our emotions demonstrated for us in the Quran in two different contrasting incidents. You know, if we revisit the story of Musa alayhi salam, you know, you're going to find in Surah An-Naml where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he talks about that incident where Musa spoke directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And during that meeting, we're told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he showed Musa a miracle, right? He made the staff turn into a snake. And we're told that Musa was so scared by that, that he physically ran away. Now, when you are scared, what kind of bodily traits do you experience? You experience increased heart rate, for example, right? You become breathless. You have adrenaline pumping around your body, correct? Now, when you physically run, what things happen to your body? Your heart rate increases. Again, right? You become breathless. There is an increase in adrenaline. So Musa's physical response to his fear, do you see how it only intensified his fear and it trapped him in that negative emotional state? You know, we're told that in that verse, he never came back, subhanAllah. Okay, so now if you contrast that to another incident mentioned in Surah al Taha, where Musa alayhi salam, he was confronted by the magicians of Egypt and he had this public jewel in front of all the people of Egypt, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that once again, Musa, he naturally felt fear, right? Of course, because some of us have been say there could have been up to 15,000 magicians, subhanAllah, that he was faced with amongst, you know, all of this crowd as well. But there was a difference highlighted here. You know, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Musa chose in this incident to conceal his fear. So how did he conceive fear only in his heart? By choosing, you know, and not allowing those emotions to be visibly transferred onto his limbs. So instead, he chose to display the physical characteristics of confidence and strength by standing tall and firm, for example. And in doing so, it allowed him to control and to lower the intensity of his fear, to potentially even eliminate it. And that's the power of physiology. So in order to really free ourselves from the emotions that are associated with a lack of confidence, like fear or worry, for example, we must consciously choose to break free from the associated physical states, right? So we need to stop with our shallow and, and, and rapid breathing. You know, we need to stop curling our body up. We need to stop crossing our arms and legs that we're using to kind of protect ourselves and comfort ourselves and mentally block things out. We need to stop with the nervous fidgeting and the biting the nails, etc., because these physical characteristics, they're only going to imprison you in those feelings of anxiousness. And instead, we have to start to choose to embody the physiology that characterizes the positive feelings of confidence that we actually want to feel. So by standing up more tall, by lifting our heads a bit higher, by opening up our bodies, you know, adapting certain gestures, maintaining stronger eye contact, you know, breathing more deeply, etc. Because again, just remember that motion creates emotion. Okay, the fourth Quranic idea I have for you for becoming more confident, inshallah, is momentum. Now, momentum is key to confidence. You know, it's when we stop having momentum in our life that we actually start experiencing feelings of being lost 
or feeling confused and we start feeling down about ourselves, we experience a lack of confidence. You know, a lot of people, they think that it's simply the decisions that they make in their life that is the most important thing. That it's your decisions that are going to define who you are and it's going to determine your success. And that isn't completely true. Because although your intentions are, you know, they're necessary and very powerful first step towards moving in a direction, the truth is that a lot of people, they decide to do a lot of good things in life or become something better, but they don't actually do it, right? You know, some people, they decide to become uh, better, you know, better loving parents, for example, or they decide to lose more weight or read more Quran, but they don't actually end up doing it. And that's because the act of making a decision, the act of having an intention, although it's important and it's something that's praiseworthy and beautifully rewarded in Islam even, it doesn't directly cause something to manifest into something real, right? That happens when you have disciplined action. And that's why, subhanAllah, in Islam, you get another reward when you actually act on your good intentions and that's why, interestingly as well, in Islam, our iman, our faith, is actually defined as what's in the heart as well as what's on the limbs together, subhanAllah. So what I'm saying is that, you know, you can choose to be confident in your life right now if you wanted to, simply by having the intention to. And it does help, yes. But if you really want to start feeling unbreakable confidence, you know, to really start make, feeling it more naturally emanating from within you and on a more consistent basis long term, then you're going to achieve that, inshallah, when you move forward through, you know, towards your goals through taking consistent action and building up momentum. Because, you know, when we are consistently taking action and building momentum in life, we're progressing. And then we start hitting certain milestones and experiencing these small wins. And we also give ourselves the opportunity as well to develop competency as well in our journey. And, you know, when we regularly acknowledge and connect with our strengths, all of these things, they empower us and they naturally help us to build greater levels of confidence, inshallah. Now, I know some people are going to say, you know, well, how can I start taking action, Halima, and creating momentum in my life when I don't know what the bigger picture is yet? You know, I don't have a clear vision for my life or a clear plan of where I want to go and what I want to do. I haven't quite decided that for myself yet. And so these kind of people, they stay stuck. They kind of linger in this state of procrastination and this just kills their confidence. Well, what a lot of people don't actually realize is that often some of the best decisions that we make in our life come after we have momentum at something. Because when we gain momentum, we also gain perspective. So instead of just waiting around in your life for the perfect plan to, you know, to come to fruition, for the perfect person, the perfect timing, instead of just being at this whim of the external world around you that's only going to dampen your confidence, it's really important you start asking yourself, what can I do right now to begin? even if you're not sure of the bigger picture. Because when we start moving forward, like I said, things become more apparent. You, stay, you gain better perspective and make better decisions and essentially become more confident. You know, you can stand from far away trying to squint your eyes, looking at a road sign, trying to figure out what it says, when actually you can just start moving forward towards it, move along that road, and you'll be able to clearly see the signs better, right? And that's why we have the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he told us that the best of deeds are those that are done regularly, even if they're few. Because, you know, vision, it can bring you the sense of direction you need and inspiration even. But momentum is what's going to give you that confidence to pursue those things in the first place. You know, to really illustrate this Quranic teaching, I want to share with you, inshallah, two similar verses in the Quran. One is found in Surah Al-Baqarah and the other one is found in Surah Al-Anfal. And they both deal with fighting in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The context of these ayah, they relate to the Battle of Badr. So for those who don't know the context, you know, Muslims, they had been really harshly oppressed. They had been expelled from their homes unjustly. And because they hadn't initiated any violence themselves, they were justified in fighting back for their homes. But the reality is that they were very few in number. They didn't have hardly any military resource. Whereas the Quraysh, on the other hand, they were very powerful, you know, in terms of manpower, in terms of resources, etc. Now, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says to the Muslims, fight until there is no more tribulation, no more corruption, and the deen, the religion or the way of life, it belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in Surah Al-Anfal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fight them until there is no more tribulation or corruption, and until the religion in its entirety belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, although those verses sounded really similar, right, because they dealt with the same context, you would have noticed that there is a difference in the command that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala issued to the Muslims within those two verses, right? 
you know, one is to fight until the deen belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the other one is to fight until the deen in its entirety belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And interestingly, this difference is because of a difference in the timing of revelation between the two verses. The first verse in Surah Baqarah, it was actually revealed before the Battle of Badr. And the ayah in Surah Al-Anfar was revealed after the battle. Now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he told the Muslims in Surah Al-Baqarah to fight until the religion belonged to Allah, it's really important that we understand that anyone at that time of revelation that lived in that region, when they thought about the deen, they immediately thought about the Kaaba and Mecca because all of their religious idols resided there. So the Muslims understood this ayah to mean that they would need to fight because yes, of course, they've been expelled and oppressed, but then they would need to continue fighting until Mecca belonged to Allah, until the Kaaba was cleansed and restored to the original legacy of Ibrahim. Because the tribulation and corruption mentioned in these verses actually is talking about overcoming the spread of false religion. Now, when the ayah in Surah Al-Anfal was revealed, and it told them that, you know, they'd actually have to continue fighting until the entire religion belonged to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that meant that the whole of the region needed to be cleared of false uh, religion, and not just the Kaaba or Mecca. And that is a substantially weightier command, right? That's a much bigger goal. But there's a great lesson in here for us to learn, inshallah, in the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave the Muslims an order on two different scales, according to two different time periods on their journey. In the first ayah that was revealed, like I said, before the Battle of Badr, where the Muslims, you know, they basically, the situation looked really bleak to them. They weren't sure how things were gonna turn out. The odds certainly weren't in their favor. You know, they were around 300 outnumbered to around 1,000. But as you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he then granted those believers a tremendous and an extraordinary victory in that battle, right? And then after that happened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed, you know, this commandment again, once more for them to remind them that they need to continue fighting, that this time their task was a lot greater. Their duty was a lot heavier to fulfill. And the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala waited to reveal the full extent of his command till after the battle was because the Muslims were now empowered and more confident in their ability as a result of the actions and the momentum they had. So they, they would feel more capable of going ahead with an even bigger challenge, right? Had that verse in Surah Al-Anfal been revealed before, then they would have just been intimidated by that vision. They, wouldn't have, they would have seen it as something too big because they didn't have the confidence to pursue it. But as a result of the actions and the momentum that they gained first, then they were able to, you know, by having these smaller wins, it helped them to have a lot more confidence in their ability to go on and do bigger things, to cleanse the entire region of shirk. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in his perfect knowledge of us as his creation, he demonstrates for us in these verses how we as human beings best operate on a cognitive level. It teaches us that although vision is really key to us having direction and inspiration, momentum is what's actually really key to attaining the confidence we need to pursue our goals and dreams in the first place. Okay, so the last, the fifth Quranic idea I have for you, inshallah, to try to help you build more confidence in yourself is your company. You know, we all need people around us who are super positive and supportive, who can see and appreciate inside us the good that we have and the good that we do. Because, you know, sometimes it's hard for us to see the picture when we're part of the frame. Meaning, when we're going through the emotions of life, we can sometimes lose sight of these things about ourselves, right? You know, being able to have people around us that we can reach out to and to share our struggles and our failures and our fears, because we all have them, we're human beings, you know, and for them to be able to offer us the encouragement that we need to remind us of our worth and our abilities, it's really important to sustain our levels of confidence. Because sometimes it's simply easier for other people to be able to see in us what we don't see in ourselves. And when they share those things with us and they bring these facts into our perspective, into our line of focus, it can help us to better internalize and integrate those strengths, I think, and you know those successes within us. And we also need people who can cheer us on along the way, right? And who we can meaningfully celebrate our small and our big, our big wins with as well. All of these things are really helpful to boost our confidence. And if you look into the Quran, we see the impact and the importance of our company with regards to our levels of confidence, again, when we revisit the story of Musa. You know, when he was given the mission of prophethood and he was told that 
he would need to deliver this message to Fir'aun and demand that Bani Israel are freed. He expressed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his genuine fears and worries, right? And that's naturally going to impact his levels of confidence. But as such, he himself, he immediately then asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the assistance of his brother Harun, who then became a prophet and joined him in his mission. And that naturally would help increase his confidence. And even if we look at the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, when he came down from the cave of Hira, when he first re received revelation, and, you know, he was, we learned that he was very scared and he was confused, right? He, he doubted himself. He questioned his own sanity, subhanAllah. And we see that he immediately went to his wife Khadija for comfort and support. And in her beautiful statement to him, she reminded him of the good that he possessed, the good that he had done towards other people, and essentially reminded him about his worth, right? And Khadija then even took the Prophet ﷺ to her cousin Waraka to offer him more clarity and support in order to boost his confidence even further, subhanAllah. Now, if you yourself, you don't have this kind of supportive community and you know, I would say you don't need to wait around for people to show up. My advice is go out there and find people, you know, really create your community. Go to events, go to messages, you know, go to volunteer alongside other people, you know, for good causes. Go get around amazing and confident people who are going to help you and going to inspire you with the development of your own confidence too, inshallah. And of course, never underestimate the power of dua either. You know, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to connect you with the best of companies that is going to benefit you in this dunya and the akhirah. Okay, so in conclusion, when you build your levels of self-awareness through your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala via the Qur'an, and when you choose to productively manage your focus through the use of empowering questions, and when you also use your physiology to create positive emotional states for yourself, and you choose to build momentum by taking small consistent action, and you also get around really good people, then inshallah, you're going to realize with the help of the Quran, you actually manage to find the confidence that you're hoping one day that you would. Okay, so if you enjoyed this video, then please make sure that you share it with all those that you love and be sure to subscribe to the Quran Rehab channel. And if you press the icon button, then you're going to be notified every time I release content like this. So I hope this video, as always, it reminds you that when you truly transform your personal relationship with the Quran, you can truly transform yourself and your life for the better, inshallah, and start living what I call a Quran lifestyle. Okay, until next time, take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.